among all things and in the heavens there is but one from everlasting to everlasting who holds sovereignty over everything.
us this year. Heaven bestows food upon us. Mother makes a point. I'm back. 
Those who die take the stories of the living with them, and those who remain they repeat the same tragic stories as those who've gone before. So men can't but ask himself. Do we live and why do we have to die? creation of mother nature is this really how man was made is mankind in control Let there be light. Let there be a firmament in the middle of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life.
Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last.
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all things. A vibrant new world was born. Everything created by God was perfect and beautiful, displaying His wisdom, His goodness, and His almightiness. God created Adam and Eve in his own image, with his own hands, and breathed his very life into them. Jehovah God placed them in the Garden of Eden and told them, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But Adam and Eve did not heed God's instruction. They gave in to Satan's temptation and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After that, mankind became more and more corrupt, evil, and decadent. They reached the highest levels of sin. They made an enemy of God and did not allow for his existence. This was why God resolved to wipe out mankind with a flood.
One day, Jehovah God came to Noah. 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 Oh, my Lord. The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make you an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall you make in the ark. After the flood, all living, breathing things on earth had died, except for eight people in Noah's family and every animal placed upon the ark. They have continued to proliferate on earth to this very day. God made a covenant with them that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. And the rainbow seen today is proof of God's covenant with man. Jehovah said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have died. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were full of evil, licentiousness, rampant with murder, and indulgence in extravagant pleasures. They reached the point of clamoring against God, of fighting against him, and raging his disposition. Where are the men which came into you this night? Bring them out to us, that we may know them.
after the angels took Lot and his family out of the city, burning sulfur rained down from the sky. The raging fire lit up the heavens. disappearing into the wrath of God. The Israelites descendants of Abraham fled to live in exile in Egypt due to famine. The Egyptians were terrified of the Israelites' expansion, so they enslaved them. The Israelites could not bear the torture and prayed to God. God heard their prayers and decided to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He then called on Moses. Moses, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses went to see the Egyptian Pharaoh with God's command. But the Pharaoh would not agree to release the Israelites. The stubborn Pharaoh did not give in until God unleashed ten plagues. The Israelites finally departed from Egypt under God's guidance.
After escaping from the pursuing Egyptian soldiers, Moses continued to lead the Israelites southward until they came to Mount Sinai. In his almighty glory, Jehovah God descended to Mount Sinai and issued his commandments to the Israelites through Moses. God spoke all these words, saying, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make to you any graven image. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them. You shall not take the name of Jehovah your God in vain. Here and there and After leading the Israelites out of Egypt, God issued laws comprised of commandments, teachings, prohibitions, and decrees. A total of 613 laws after collation by later generations. These laws from God were issued to explicitly instruct people on how to worship God and live on this earth. These laws were the earliest detailed conditions to guide mankind on how to live, to regulate human behavior, and measure moral standards. They were also the first basis and guideline toward determining sinfulness. Since you stole from them, you should pay double. They provided standards and guidelines for future generations on the establishment of the Constitution. They also laid a foundation for the perfection of legal systems for subsequent generations. Many modern legal provisions and judicial concepts have been profoundly influenced by these laws. For example, murder, rape, robbery, libel, and embezzlement were established as crimes based on the Ten Commandments. God's laws issued to the Israelites have not only had a profound impact on human law, but have also played a critical role in the establishment and formation of moral civilization and democratic institutions in human societies. In the end, after hundreds of years of living under the restrictions of the law, the Israelites were unable to uphold the law. They constantly violated the teachings of the law, and everyone faced the danger of being condemned or put to death through the law. They were also repeatedly preyed upon by other peoples and were subjected to the torment of war and oppression. So they urgently prayed and called out to God, and they received a promise. 
a promise that the Israelites could gain an eternal sin offering and they would no longer be condemned or put to death according to the law. A promise that would revolutionize the Israelites' very existence and fate. Thus, Jehovah God told the Israelites by means of a prophet. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the year of our Lord, a male child was born in a manger in a Jewish inn in Bethlehem. Three wise men from the east, guided by a star that had never before been seen, came to the place of the child's birth. They bowed down to him in worship. This child was the one promised by God who would lead and redeem the Israelites from God's law. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But let your communication be, yes, yes, no, no. For whatever is more than these comes of evil. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. the Lord Jesus Christ put an end to the Israelites' lives of slavery to sin. They no longer had to face the peril of being condemned or executed for their inability to uphold God's law. I send the promise of my Father on you. Thomas, reach here your finger and behold my hands, and reach here your hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. In whose existence it never be, mankind has never been. 
Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Their sins were pardoned because of the Lord Jesus' sin offering. Their living conditions underwent a complete change. From then on, the Israelites no longer lived under the law. Instead, they lived under the protection of the sin offering brought to them by the Lord Jesus. It meant that the Israelites had completely cast off the binds of the law and entered an entirely new age. In this age, they were atoned of their sins through repentance and the Lord's abundant grace. And they also enjoyed the promise bestowed upon them by the Lord Jesus. It was an age replete with the Lord's mercy, love, tolerance, blessings, forgiveness, and patience. This is why we call this new age the age of grace. People's sins could be forgiven as long as they accepted the Lord Jesus as their savior and they could enjoy the rich grace and blessings bestowed upon them by God. This grace not only narrowed the gap between God and man, but also rescued humanity from their slavery to sin. This allowed people to no longer stray from God because of their sins to be absolved because of God's sin offering and because of God's rich grace, be able to come in front of him at any time, any place. The coming of the Lord Jesus brought an end to the old age of constraints by the law and ushered mankind into a new age. Meanwhile, it improved the relationship between God and man and opened up a new beginning, a new start to God's work of management among mankind. In 70 AD, 37 years after the Lord Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven, the Roman army captured Jerusalem. The diasporas of Jewish people wandered the earth after being driven out of the land of Israel. Although they had lost their homeland, they carried with them the Lord Jesus' gospel of the heavenly kingdom, which had been confined to Judea, and spread it to every corner of the world. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. She's come back to life. She's alive. She's come back to life. Hallelujah. Thanks to the Lord. Hallelujah. May the Lord have mercy on me. My legs have been healed. I can stand up. No. 
mercy on your child. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Here we must proclaim that God's wisdom surpasses the heavens and his deeds are wondrous beyond belief. Twenty-seven B.C. was the advent of the age of the Roman Empire. It gradually grew in power and became a vast empire spanning Europe, Asia, Africa, and dominating the Mediterranean. It ruled over about one-fifth of the global population at the time. After the Roman Empire captured Jerusalem, and drove the Jews out of Israel, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. In 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine I legalized Christianity. Years later, it was classified as the official state religion. The development of these events advanced the spread and expansion of Christianity throughout all of Europe, Asia, Africa, and all of mankind. It laid the foundation for Christianity among the ruling class and the common people across those continents. Of course, it influenced the lives of these people by way of their faith, thoughts, morals, and social trends. It also influenced the ideologies and political careers of generations of rulers. The expansion of Christianity in the Roman Empire and its influence led to panic among the rulers in Rome. They were afraid of and hated Christianity. To prevent Christianity from taking over their rule, they madly persecuted Christianity and murdered huge numbers of Christians. disasters, internal strife, and outside incursions upon the Roman Empire, as well as a number of epidemics. There were repeated outbreaks, the shorter ones lasting a few decades, the longer 
lasting over a century. This brought about a sharp drop in the population of the empire. The once mighty ancient Roman Empire was in decline. In 1453, ancient Rome descended into chaos. Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire. Thus, the book was closed on the glorious history of the Roman Empire. After 1,500 glorious years, this is how the final days of the empire were ushered in. Its demise came under the wrath of God. The ancient Roman Empire rose up and was founded for the spread of Christianity. Its golden age was ushered in by establishing Christianity as its national religion. And the Roman Empire was destroyed due to its persecution of Christians. Although the Roman Empire faded from view and exited the stage of history, its mission, as well as its development and existence in human history, have had a profound influence on future generations. It was a strong force for the spread of Christianity and it fueled the spread of Christian thought and its deepening in people's minds. Although ancient Rome's prosperity is a thing of the past, Christianity's influence on mankind has not ended. It has nurtured and guided generation after generation of people. It is like a seed rooted deeply in people's hearts, full of vitality. It not only liberated people's thoughts and drove the Renaissance, but it also provided an entirely new direction and inspiration for mankind's development in all walks of life. This led to Europe's art, culture, and science flourishing in unprecedented ways. In the 17th century, the victory of the bourgeois revolution in England led to the passing of the Bill of Rights, establishing the principle of Parliament's supremacy over the monarchy. As a result, England became the first constitutional monarchy, 
opening up the age of mankind, abolishing feudal monarchies and establishing constitutional monarchies. As the British constitutional monarchy was established, France, Germany, Italy, and Austria all followed suit. The bourgeois revolutions erupted, and one after another, feudal autocratic rule in these countries was overthrown. They set up their own constitutions and established their own constitutional monarchies. British industry and commerce flourished after a new shipping route was opened, driving the development of capitalism in the United Kingdom and creating a huge demand for resources. So while the UK was expanding its foreign trade, it also gradually broadened the scope of its colonial plundering and its expansion. Some countries and areas in Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, Oceania, and Antarctica, as well as in the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the Antarctic Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean, became British colonies one after another. By the early 20th century, England had conquered one quarter of the Earth's territory and its people. During England's colonial expansion, advanced knowledge and thinking in areas such as Western political systems, culture, religions, education, and medicine were introduced into the colonies. The old ruling orders of the colonized countries were overturned and the pre-existing feudal ideologies were destroyed. This laid the foundation for the colonies unknowingly embarking upon the path of constitutional democracy. This brought about a turning point in the state of the rigid, stagnant, closed societies within the colonies, infusing them with new life. This was an enduring contribution to the development of every aspect of life in the colonies. In the 1870s, through industrialization and the repeal of feudal autocratic systems in countries all over the world, England gradually lost its dominant position in global industry. After two world wars, its colonies gained independence one by one. England headed into decline completing its mission in history. In the mid to late 16th century, a group of people rose up from churches in England. 
They opposed the oppressiveness of the clergy, as well as the formalism in the church. They sought a pure religious creed, a pious life, a holy church, and a free nation. They were called the Puritans. In 1604, the British royal family ordered all Puritans to return to the state church and obey the bishop. Otherwise, they would face expulsion or even execution. So the Puritans were forced to leave Europe behind and head for North America. They were followed by larger numbers of Puritans. Some of them came from Oxford or Cambridge universities. They were generally more educated than most Europeans. They advocated for the concepts of autonomy, equality, and democracy, as well as God's teachings. They infused the United States Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution with these values. Without the Puritans, the United States of America would not have come into existence. And the separation of the three powers would never have been set up. So not only were the Puritans the cornerstone of the establishment of the USA, they were the pioneers who made America strong. On July 4, 1776, when the United States Declaration of Independence was passed, an independent, rising, multi-ethnic country was formed in North America. That is the United States of America we know today. George Washington, the first president of the United States, said, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. Creation. 
creation dwells beneath his mighty bed. All things exist beneath his gaze. All creation dwells beneath his After the Civil War, the American economy developed rapidly. In 1894, the U.S. became the country with the greatest gross industrial output worldwide. Economic prosperity in the U.S. followed the outbreak of World War I. After the war, the U.S. turned from a country in debt owing six billion U.S. dollars into a creditor country that was owed more than 10 billion U.S. dollars. It was the most prosperous nation on the planet. After World War II, America's military strength continued to grow, and it established more than 5,000 military bases all over the world. From an economic or a military perspective, the U.S. had become an undisputed world superpower. This established its political position in the world. On the basis of adhering to its founding principles of freedom, democracy, and equality, the U.S. took up its duty to play the role of the global police. So the U.S. has continued to intervene and interfere with world trends, to effectively curb the expansion of authoritarian forces, and to protect large numbers of people from all walks of life who have been persecuted for religious or political reasons. It has also greatly contained the spread of various evil forces and weakened the damage done to mankind by evil forces. In a sense, the U.S. has played an important role in stabilizing the global situation and providing a balance for world order. It plays an irreplaceable role in safeguarding and stabilizing our global situation. Jesus. 